Thank you so much for all of you coming, making this convention so memorable. I know some of you it wasn't easy to come, but you came, you made it. Thankful for God for my youngest son, Anthony, and his wife, Jacinta, are here too. <laughs> Not always that you have the whole family. Sorry, Richard couldn't come. Wasn't it so beautiful how Russell just shared about worship? Oh. But you know, I think it's the most powerful thing is when Hillsong introduced their worship and it was it included just included so many young people all of a sudden young people came alive and they were part of worship monastic worship was not for young people but it's amazing when hill songs came all that you see here today i think is the fruit of hill songs would you agree with me come on let's give the lord a hand for hill song well, i forgot to say that my Baby daughter is also here. <laughs> Russell was the first fruit, she was the last fruit. <laughs> Thank you so much. I want to share the last part of the vision of how God is going to rescue men and begin to raise them up. I've never been so excited about the vision that God has given me. That's why I've decided to hand over ministry to Russell and Nina. And I'm going to, my wife and I are going to focus on this. Because I believe this is the end time story. When men of God find their rightful place in the house of God. God turns their hearts and they begin to turn the hearts of the this, the next generation, because the coming of the Lord is at hand. If you've got your Bibles, turn with me to Psalm 2. Reading from verse 4. It says, He who sits in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord will hold him in derision. Then he shall speak to them in his wrath and distress them in his deep displeasure, yet I've set my king on my holy hill of Zion, and I will declare the decree the Lord has said to me, you are my son. Today, I have begotten you. Ask of me, and I will give you the nations as an inheritance, and the ends of the earth is your position. You shall break them with the rod of iron, and you shall dash them in pieces like a potter's vessels. Then in verse 11 it says, Serve the Lord with fear, and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son, lest he be angry, and you perish in the way. Father, thank you. Thank you for the life that you've offered us. If you can just understand, God, that it's a process of reaching the unreachable and just discovering what you have created us for, for a time such as this, Father, I pray this morning that you will give, just do something in our hearts, the hearts of men, God, that you would restore things, God, that the canker worm has stolen. And that you would bring men to the fullness of who you created them to be, God. In the name of Jesus, Lord, the breakthrough is coming, God, when men are going to rise up and reposition themselves and take on the full armor of God and begin to do incredible things, Father. In Jesus' name. I just shudder. When I see this army of men arising, 
just in the fullness of the power and the Spirit of God and taking their positions in the church and in the workplace and in the kingdom of God. And I'm just shadowing a thing of what's going to happen. And how God is going to begin to give them assignments. You go here and you go there and you go there. And whatever you're doing, you will give it up to fulfill that that God asks you to fulfill. One of the most, it's going to be one of the most historic times in the church of our Lord Jesus Christ. We've never seen it before. I think it happened in the times of David when he was going to restore the kingdom of Israel. And the first thing God gave him, men. And he raised these men up to become like the army of God. And they conquered. And Israel came into a most prosperous time because of men. Sometimes you think it was because of David. Yes, it was. But it was because of the men that had aligned themselves to him spiritually. And they conquered what no army could conquer. Amen. Now, there are certain assignments that Jesus gives us when we reach maturity. He doesn't give us when we're immature. Grace saves you. But beyond grace, you have to discipline yourself. Amen? You have to be discipled. You have to go through something. You have to go through something that refines you so that you can reach this place of Psalm 2. And then God will say, ask of me. You understand? Ask of me. Sometimes you think it's impossible to reach that place. It is possible. It took Jesus 30 years to reach that place, even though he was the son of God. And he reached that place and he said, ask of me. You're here today. Nations are here today because of what happened that time. And he said, I'll give you the nations. Amen. I will give you. You will, you will see a phenomenal thing when he returns of how the Bible says every knee and every tongue is going to bow and confess that he is Lord because he rescued nations. Yeah. Would you say amen? Yeah. I want to take you through the process. How do I reach there as a man of God? Because if you reach there, your children will reach there. Amen. Sometimes we disregard the lineage that we come out of. And we take it lightly. And to tell you, the lineage that my wife and I have handed over to our children cost us everything. It wasn't cheap. We didn't come into this thing because of prophecy. We came into this thing underground and God had pushed us underground. But because of his power, he resurrected us. I'm going to share with you how, how, do I, how, how do I reach that place as a man? How do I take my family to that place where the world doesn't dictate to me anymore? But the Spirit of God leads me into every dimension of life. Every person has three, four dimensions of life, and very often we don't even overcome the first one because we have no vision to move on, to move forward. In what God has planned for your family. Men, come on. God has planned awesome things for your household. Don't settle for the, the least when you can get the most. Psalm 66.10. Psalmist is relating how he reached this place. And he said, for you, O Lord, tested us. He said, you refined us like silver. He said, and then you brought us into this place of abundance. Who wants to go through the refining process? Very few of us. Because today, today's theology is blessed. It's a blessed me theology. But you cannot be really blessed until you've been refined because you won't appreciate the blessings of God. You'll think you earn them. That place of abundance is when you have enough of the word and the spirit in you that will enable you to beget sons will enable you to allow God to touch your family. One of the most priceless things. It's one thing to have children, 
but have you got a vision for them? Any, anybody can have children. If you have a vision for them. If you don't have a vision for children, close shop. Put a key. Do you understand what I mean? Because they all, they all, they, God puts them into you. God brings life into them through you because he has a vision for them. And he says, you must have a vision for them too. Ask of me. Ask of me what have you got for them. And he will begin to release it to you. 1 Corinthians 4, 15 says, for in Christ Jesus. This is Paul. He had reached this place. He says, for in Christ Jesus, I have begotten you through the gospel. Two powerful things. When a man's spirit is enlarged and he speaks truth into his children, it's amazing what begins to happen to them. Yes, mother feeds them. The father feeds them in a different dimension of life. That's why, that's why a man has got to have a wife because the wife plays such an important part in the child's life and you play such an important child's life. Why? Because you, you're bringing giants to be part of this earth. Do you understand what I'm talking about? I think we're getting back into this now. If we leave the convention and we haven't got vision, then why did you pay all the money to come here? Because that's what Hannah went to Shiloh for. She wanted vision for the son that God was going to give her. And you said, if you give me a son, I will give him back to you. And because I've given him to you, he'll become the greatest prophet and the greatest judge that ever lived in Israel. This judge that could speak to the heavens and hail would come down, rain would come down. This is the caliber of type of man that Hannah brought forth into the world. You can do it. This is what God is looking for, that type of family that brings these incredible sons of God into the face of the earth. Amen. Amen. We've looked down upon ourselves. We always thought we were second-class citizens. We are not. We are children of God. We are blood-washed. We are filled with the Spirit of God. And we can produce those caliber of young people. you to go home today and I want you to think about that. Amen? Don't allow your children just to find things for themselves. Help you to find them. Go behind them and help to find them because they're irresponsible. They don't have enough of the spirit to discern what they should do. If the Lord hasn't become your shepherd, you'll mess your life up because he leads you. That's, what, that's Paul. That's, what, that's why he said, the, he said in Galatians 1.12, he said, the gospel I preached, I did not receive from man. He said, I received it by revelation of Jesus Christ. He gave it to me when I'd reached this place, this growth place in my life. He gave me a gospel. He gave me words to speak into young people's lives. That's why for 2,000 years, this gospel is still alive. And every time you read it, It does something into your spirit. That's what this gospel is for. It's to give growth to your spirit, man, so that you too can begin to do what he did. Fascinated with the power of the gospel. If you read it through the eyes of the spirit and how it begins to grow you spiritually. People, you've got to grow spiritually in this world today. If you don't grow spiritually, the spirit of the world will take over your life. And get caught up with things in the church. Don't get caught up with lights. These are imitations. These are man-made. There is a light. And the light is Jesus. Let him shine bright in you. Sometimes we go to churches just because of these lights. And the smoke. not its imitation it's counterfeit and become used to this this is his counterfeit and we don't really move into life with what is genuine amen the refining process 
Amen. When you go, you just say, God, take me through to my refining process. That's part of discipline. And that is most profitable to you. It's during the process of being refined that our weaknesses are brought to the surface and are destroyed by fire. Have you ever realized that when you really begin to pursue God, there's always fire? This is what happened in the upper room. And the fire settled on every of their heads. Why do you think the fire settled? That was not the spirit, it was fire so that they could stay humble. And all these things would be burnt up when they try and resurface. No matter how Peter tried to go back fishing, he couldn't go back because that part of his life was burnt up. Something about our old life's got to be burnt up. That's why you've got to be baptized because that's where the old man is buried forever. You see, you can't move on. You can't move on in God if the old man is still dominant in your life. Malachi 3, 2 says, Who can endure the day of his coming? For he will be like a refiner's fire. Verse 3 says, He will sit at the refiner and a purifier of silver, and he will purify the sons of Levi and purge and cleanse him as gold and silver. Guys, you understand? You understand God's plan for you and your plans for me is to refine us like gold and silver, the most precious of metals. That's who you are. Can we reach that place? See, this is, this, is part, this is part of the convention is to challenge you to come out of that place that you're in and come into this place that he has prepared for you he didn't just create you, he prepared a place for you. Can you give me some water, please? And when I find that place, I make space for my family. Whatever I find, I make space for my household. And this is the power. This is the power of fatherhood. I don't just go and work and give them bread. No, they just get fat and useless. But when I find a space for them in the kingdom of God, it's amazing what happens. You begin to develop giants in your home. Can someone just give the Lord a hand for this man? I never knew one day in my life I'll have a... That Joshua would walk alongside me, care for me. Verse 3 of Malachi 3. It says, then the Lord will have men who will bring offerings in righteousness. I shared with you last night that next convention, we want to see the appearing of men, mature men, the sons of God. And I'd like men to take the front positions now in every dimension of life. If we failed us, God's going to smite the earth with a curse. I believe that the offerings of Zion will be acceptable to the Lord as the day has gone by. If what we do for the Lord is not acceptable, it does not bear fruit. And I believe when we fathers join ourselves to Jesus and become one spirit with him, and what we do, what we do will become acceptable to him. I think that's the whole difference is what I do becomes acceptable to him. Then when we have enough of the spirit of Jesus, the everlasting father, then the words that we speak will begin to separate. I love that. We'll begin. Jesus would come into an assembly and he would separate certain people. That's the power of it. And I think every one of you, that's what you're longing for. Deep down in your heart is for someone to separate you so that you can fulfill purpose. Am I? Am I right? 
That's why you're here. That's why you paid all this money, because you want to be separated. And you need someone to come and separate you. Yes, Paul met Jesus on the road to Damascus, but, but it was amazing how, 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 what was his name that came? Barnabas. Barnabas. How Barnabas came. And he was moving around and trying to fit into the church, and he couldn't. And then Barnabas came. And what did Barnabas do? Barnabas took him to Antioch. Antioch was a mission Based church. They were sending people out into the world because that's what God had called Paul for. That's what God, God calls us for. To go and minister to nations, but you've got to go have someone that can discipline you and disciple you and prepare you. He was called, but he wasn't prepared. And it's amazing, after a while, the Spirit said, Separate from me, Paul and Barnabas, for the work that I have called in. Do you think we can reach a place where the separation takes place? for the particular calling, the ministry that God has called you for. I want to relate the story of when God separated me right in the center of my workplace. And he said, leave all things and come and follow me. In all my life, I've never experienced an anointing like that. And there was I in my work clothes, and I began to cry. For one and for an half an hour, I just cried. I didn't understand what, but it was because of the calling of God in my life. Everyone has a different, Paul, Paul just went blind, blind to his own life until Ananias prayed for him and he got sight for what God had prepared for him. There's someone that God's going to send into your life and he's going to help dis discipline you and disciple you and prepare you for when God comes and the final separation. Is that what you're waiting for? The final separation. This is who I want to be, God. Eh? This is who I want to be. Yes, I've studied. I've, I've done a lot of things, education, all that. But it didn't satisfy my spirit, God. And then the calling comes. Salvation is one thing. But if it doesn't lead you to your calling, it will lose its value. How do I reach a place? It's a powerful place. As I fully says, those who wait upon the Lord for this joining to take place, he said, they shall renew their strength. And it says, and they will rise up to the place we become one with Jesus. One spirit to Jesus. How many of you know it's in a higher level? There's, there's things that God, he saves you at a lower level. But then he wants to take you to a higher level to experience what he has planned for you. Do you realize that? Now, he, he doesn't just take you. He expects you to take yourself up. He said, if you pray, if you wait on me, all of a sudden you will begin to rise up. There's different levels. There's different levels when you meet with God. And every level that you meet with God, something more is beginning to happen to you. There's, there's a more expansion of who you are. Some, most of who you are is hidden in you. And when you pray, there's an expansion of it. You begin to grow. You begin to develop in confidence and everything else that you need with what God has planned for you to do. But he said, if you wait on me, it will begin to happen. Just discipline yourself. That's what Russell was talking about with these monks how they discipline themselves. And a lot of times we thought they were doing nothing in the monastery, but they were actually shaping history. There's some people that are caught into the world and there's some people that will stay in monasteries and they will shape the world. They actually create byways for you and I to go to the nations. It's an amazing thing. Now, when we reach a deeper level of our relationship with Jesus, then we will begin to receive the revelation that brings freedom to the emerging generation. There's a word. Do you ever realize there's a word for everything, every generation that finds freedom, there's first a word that God releases into the mouth of someone. 
I loved, I loved the word that God released into John the Baptist. And they said, who are you? Are you the Christ? Are you, who are you? He said, I am the voice of one crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. And it's amazing what began to happen. The voice. That's all he said. He was just a voice. Didn't do any miracles. He was just a voice. Sometimes we under, underestimate that. We under, under, underestimate the voice, the voice of God, the word of God. Yeah. And very often it does more than when you lay hands on people because the word of God gets into the man's spirit and begins to give freedom into a man's spirit. It's the word of God that separates the spirit of a man from the control of his soul. And that's how we begin to make progress in God. And there's no one that just gets that word. You have to discipline yourself. You have to pray. And all of a sudden it comes. The Bible says, and the word of God came to John in the desert. It didn't come to John in the temple. It came to John in the desert after eating wild locusts and honey for I don't know how long. And it came to him. This is what Jesus said in Luke, in Luke 4. And the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to do what? To preach the gospel to the poor. The word of God even came to him. You think you can sacrifice for that? I think you can. I think you can. I think you can. Just to get that, just to get that spirit and to get the word. It's in the deeper places that we receive the spirit without measure then we're able to pray from the Spirit within us into the sons of God. And that the word is always connected to that. I love what, I love what they said in 2 Kings 2.15. And the prophets who didn't follow Elijah, they said the spirit of Elijah is now resting on Elijah. The powerful thing, the spirit, the spirit of Elijah is now resting on Elisha. And he began to do all the miracles that Elijah did because the spirit of Elijah was on him. God, God don't in, underestimate the spirit that God develops in you. It will do miracles, miracles in the lives of your children and in the lives of people because it's a resting spirit. And when your spirit rests on someone, it begins to do that work that it accomplished in you. Amen. 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 Never compete with your father. Serve him and honor him. And then you will receive from him. And you will take the ministry that he started to the next level. What a pioneer starts never reaches the top. Most of the times what a pioneer starts, he just digs foundations. This ministry is just in its foundational stage. Russell and Nina and Sherwin and Merrill, they'll begin to build on it. Maybe others that come up, they, they won't reach the peak of this ministry. There are others that are coming, they will reach the peak. It takes three to four generations for a ministry to reach its peak. And very often they think, I'm the main man, I started this thing. You just started it, you won't, you, you won't finish it. The starters and the finishers. So don't fight the old man. Wait until he hands it over to you. And this is what I'm going to do after previous word. I'm going to hand this whole leadership ministry over to Russell and Nina. And Sherwin and Mary will be the understudy. As Russell was my understudy, they'll be their understudy. In case they think they're too big for their boots, the understudy will take over. You see, if I thought I was too big for my boots, my understudy would take over. But praise God, I've always wore shoes. <laughs> Numbers 11, 16. God said to Moses, bring me 70 elders who are known to you as leaders and officials among the people. Make them come to the tent of meeting, that I may stand there with you, huh? with you. Verse 17 says, then I will take 
down and take from the spirit that is in you and put it on the spirit and put the spirit on them. Isn't that phenomenal? Isn't that phenomenal? How God never bypasses his generals. I always tell you, God never bypasses the father in a home. He never bypasses the father in a church. He'll always work through that father. The powerful thing. He take his, I'll take the spirit out of you, and I will put it on them. And he says, and then they will help you carry the burden of the people. Then they will help you. The powerful thing. The powerful thing. So be the, to becoming the leader of this NZMI is not just a head thing. It's a spirit thing. Because God's going to take of your spirit and impart it onto your leaders. And if you've got a weak spirit, they'll become weak too. There was one weakness in Abraham. And he lied. And he never asked God to take that weakness away from him. You know that that weakness appeared in Isaac. And the spirit really multiplied in Jacob. Verse 17. Okay. And if we want our leaders to help us complete what God has asked us to start, then God will take the spirit that is on us and put it on our sons. I keep on telling my children, never, never think what God has started with Rod and I is inferior. We pay the price for this. It didn't come to us from our fathers or our forefathers. Our forefathers were unsaved. We pay the price for this. Now, Deuteronomy 34.9. Says Joshua was filled with the spirit of, of wisdom because Moses had laid hands on him. Numbers 27, 20. God gave, jo God gave Joshua some, God give Joshua some of your anointing so that the whole Israel community will obey you. In verse 23 of Joshua 20, 27, it says, Then Moses commissioned Joshua to succeed him. Powerful language. He commissioned Joshua to succeed him after 40 years. I don't you understand that. Sometimes you want ministry after two years, after five years. Don't rush into ministry. Wait until you are commissioned. Amen? There's a powerful thing in that till you are commissioned. And this was Joshua. 40 years, you was just Moses is armor bearer. He said, and once you're commissioned, he said, then you will take possession of the land of Canaan. Because of this commission, God gave Joshua success in everything he did. Joshua 5, 1, 5, God said to Joshua, as I was with Moses, so will I be with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. The powerful thing. How long it took him to reach that place? 40 years of serving the man of God. Some of us serve two years and then we go to someone else. Three years and we go to someone else. We hop around and hop around. In the end, we get nothing. Because sometimes we end up with a man who hasn't got the spirit that will release it to you. Don't, don't be taken up by a man's fancy shoes. Don't be taken up by how he shouts. Has he got a spirit that will be released in you? Who would ever think John the Baptist would be such a great man of God the way he dressed? Huh? Sackcloth. Who would want to follow a man dressed in sackcloth? The Bible says when you looked at Jesus, you wouldn't, even, you wouldn't even think he was a prophet. He had nothing that you would desire of him. But he was a man. He was a man. Never had a church 
never had a burial policy, never even had a horse to ride, borrowed a donkey to go into Jerusalem. He was the man. Would you follow a man like that? I don't think we'd follow a man like that today, hey, would we? No. Our men have got these big Mercedes, they've got these big houses, they've got everything. That's what we follow. We think if someone's got big things, he'll give you big things. He's got big things for himself, he might not give you anything. <laughs> How do we fathers develop strong men, a strong spirit? I must establish a disciplined prayer life that I go into the presence of God every day of my life, no matter where I am. No matter where I am, I get up every morning and I pray to God. And every morning I get up and I pray with my wife. And every night I pray with my wife and I pray with my congregation. My congregation never prays without me. Just in case I'm out ministry, then I'll appoint someone to help. But I'm always there. Because I want to give them the example of the discipline, what happens if you discipline yourself and pray. And a lot of them don't. And a lot of them that don't will never reach a place of discipline. Amen. I was going to finish off by sharing how the psalm is in Psalm 42 found the real essence of prayer. And he starts by saying, as the deer pants for the water brooks. He says, so pants my soul. Some Bible says, so long, so pants. You know, when a, when a, have you ever watched a, a, a dog or it, when, it got, when, it, when it hasn't had water for a long time, how the tongue comes out and begins to pant? That's a thirst. Uh, and then he says those fantastic words. He says, when shall I come and appear before you? This is prayer. Prayer will never change you. It's when you come, it's when prayer becomes a channel that allows you to appear before God. That's the time when change comes. But you cannot appear before God if you don't pray. If you don't reach the water brooks. It's hardly likely to ever appear before God. And if you discipline yourself and appear before God, every morning you reach a place where you will receive the call to come into the deep. You see, the water brooks dry up every now and then. And the problem with water brooks, they're only at your ankle. And all this other part of you is still in the world. You've got to reach something that covers everything. And that you've come in the deep. And then it's amazing. It's amazing when, the, when you respond to the call to the deep. How he comes into this waterfall anointing. That comes from the top. Not from the bottom. Comes from the top. And it just messes you up. They call it the waterfall. They call it the costly anointing. That's going to cost you something. <laughs> That if you don't go there, your ministry is dry. So every time you go and minister, you go under the waterfall. It's a powerful thing. The power, you might not know what you're going to say. Go under the waterfall and you'll see what you're going to say. It's like before I present myself to God's people, i got to come from the waterfall. That's the power of Esther. Before she presented herself to the king, she said, tell the people to fast for three days. If I perish, I perish. But where, after three days, she was presentable and she came to the king and she got what she wanted. Don't un underestimate that. You are not born to stay in the water brooks. You are born to live under the waterfall anointing. The spirit of the Lord is upon me. Because he has anointed me. I'm under the waterfall anointing. And he's given me a word to, to preach to the poor, to heal the sick, to heal the blind. I'm, this is where I am. Men can be going to reach that. <laughs> Men be going to reach that. Let me tell you this. The psalmist wasn't a woman. The psalmist was a man. 
They said we men eat a lot and we have a little bit of the spirit. I've seen women in Cape Town that consume more than men. <laughs> Don't ever think that women eat less than men. Women can consume. And the more you consume, the weaker your spirit gets. You say no glutton will ever enter the kingdom of God. Amen. 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 This is the wonderful anointing that Peter has in Acts 3. And he's going to the gate of the temple and he sees this bigger man. And this bigger man asks him for money. And Peter says to you, silver and gold I don't have. He said, well, what do you have? I give to you. <laughs> in the name of Jesus, what do you have? <laughs> what do you have? What do you have? What do you have? The priceless thing is the anointing, the waterfall anointing. I have it. I don't need silver and gold anymore because the waterfall anointing will supply all my needs according to his riches and glory. I got it. I've got a time problem. I've always asked the guys, give me more time. Uh, let me finish off. Because I want to ordain my son, and I want to ordain Pastor Sean. And then we're going to have a baptism afterwards. I'm going to have a baptism before lunch. Before lunch. I've got so many, so many things to do before lunch. So let me stop now. Father, thank you for what you start in the hearts of men. And I believe, God, your word says what you start, you will bring to completion. And we believe, God, that as the men go home today, they're going to go with a strong desire of coming out of what they are in and to coming into what you have purposed and prepared for them in Jesus' name. Lord, we trust in you to raise up a new generation of fathers. Could you say, stand up and say, I'm a father. I'm in the process of becoming an end, end time father to the fatherless generation in Jesus' name.